Why are you here? You are here because you care about the environment, women and men. Thank you for being here as well. The tagline for the event and of course for uh, your purposes, educating and inspiring women to take action. So I challenge you all to take action after this day has come and gone. So my charge was to talk about global eco-business and I come to this um, through my role as a professor at, at Aquinas College in our sustainable business program. And in that role, I get to see some tremendous trends that are going to be reshaping our world. And one of the things that really excites me is that women are at the heart of these trends. And so I wanna just share in my four minutes a quick overview of some of what I see as the key trends and then some really influential people who are there. This is trend number one, a focus on biomimicry. We leave out the part where animals eat their young. <laughs> what we talk about are those things that are reshaping how we have fans in our cars, using the models and the inspiration of nature. This is not a new idea since we've tried to fly. We've used biomimicry or nature as a model and a mentor for us and a measure, as Janine Benyus has talked about it. A woman who is a writer who has really brought biomimicry into corporations, governments all across the world, a really powerful person. Number tr other trend, carbon-free power. We talked a lot about that today. What does it mean to have power that is not going to fry us on the planet? And this is a really uh, exciting area of innovation. Today, she's a businesswoman. Um, she has developed a compressed air storage technology that will allow us to take wind power, solar power, all those intermittent kinds of power and um, store it, green chemistry. Again, multi-billion dollar industry. We're just at the cusp of it. Grand Valley has a wonderful um, education program around green energy. They're one of our, or green chemistry. They're one of our partners in a state-funded project called the Michigan Green Chemistry Clearinghouse. Great resources. Um, the woman that I saw front and center in this, um, she comes from a historical point of view. Anybody recognize her? Teo Colburn. Teo Colburn was one of the leading scientists to bring forward the idea that there are chemical substances that are, are disrupting endocrine systems. Um, tremendous influence, wrote a book, Our Stolen Future, and some uh, put her in the same category as, as um, Rachel Carson. Next trend, the power of organization. And there's one woman who really stands out to me for this, on, particularly on a global basis. Um, we lost her too early, Wangari Matai, Nobel laureate, environmentalist, scientist, parliamentarian, founder of the Green Belt Movement. These are trends that are shaping our world. They're shaping it in business, offering us great opportunities for innovation, great um, opportunities that call upon us as women with the unique skills and perspectives that we bring uh, to getting things done. So that's my four minutes, I hope. The whole reason why I started Tree Huggers actually started from vermicomposting, believe it or not. Um, I was watching Oprah one day and <laughs> there was this there were these two families that swapped lives, and one family was really green, the other family not so much. And um, the green family had a vermicomposter, and it was the middle of winter, and I was like, I really want to start doing that. Uh, so I called every store that I could think of within like a 100 mile radius, and nobody carried this particular vermicomposter that I was interested in. And so I had no other choice but to buy it on Amazon. So it took me about two months to build up the courage. My husband thought I was crazy. He still thinks I'm crazy. Uh, <laughs> but so on my doorstep arrived my vermicomposter and my worms. And I literally sat on the floor in my dining room for probably about two hours putting together this vermicomposter. And I was so nervous that I was going to kill the little guys and that, you know, it was going to smell and all the things that you worry about when you bring a thousand worms into your household. <laughs> but once I started doing it, I realized just how simple it really was. And um, from there came the Facebook updates um, about how my worms were doing and from that I had a lot of people just contacting me saying hey you know what are you doing with worms and, and what exactly you know just the idea of composting was wasn't familiar to a lot of people within my generation and um, you know out of that just came this whole 
kind of thought that you know the average person or the average woman out there wants to do more and they either want to start composting or they want to start recycling but they don't really know how to get started um, but once they do get started they realize just how simple it is um, and so if there was only some place they could go or someone that they could talk to that could give them that practical advice or you know just the you can do it kid type enthusiasm that they need that more people would do more for the environment um, so Tree Huggers kind of started as a consulting business, but you can't really go door to door and be like, let me help you set up a compost bin, or what is that that you're throwing away over there? So uh, one day it just kind of hit me that it needed to be a store, and the store just really kind of created that safe environment where the average person can walk in off the street, ask the questions that they've been wanting to ask, and get practical advice from somebody just like them. Um, so with the store, we've been able to create um, really just kind of this sense of community where people can come in and, and just kind of talk to somebody and touch something and, you know, actually see something without having to just kind of take that, you know, gut instinct of, of ordering it off of the internet. Um, you know, with that, we've done really pretty great things. We've been able to source about 40% of the store with products made locally within Michigan or within the United States. Um, you know, with the products that we sell, we, we really try to make sure that that they're done sustainably. Um, and that's kind of the reason why I was brought here today is, you know, it's, it's more than a store. And, and the way I look at it is, is that the store is, is the front of something bigger. You know, I really do want to create that community. And so if it doesn't fit the criteria of what I'm looking for, I just simply won't carry it. Um, but not only does it have to be made locally or, you know, sustainably, but it also has to be made of recycled materials. One of the philosophies that I have for the store is that we never bring in a new plastic. No matter how the cool the product is or how awesome of an idea or what have you, if it's made from a petroleum-based substance that hasn't been recycled, it's just something that we won't carry. Um, we also won't carry something that... Um, doesn't have a way to be recycled or composted when its life is ended. So if I can't recycle it or if I can't compost it or if I can't reuse it in some way, it's also something that I won't carry. So there's a lot that goes into picking the items that we offer in the store. Um, you know, but above that, it's, it really is that sense of community that I think makes us um, you know, more than just some place that you can go and buy a really cool toothbrush made out of a yogurt cup, which happens to be my absolute favorite thing in the store. <laughs> People think I'm crazy, again, for that. But um, I think one of the things that I'm the most proud of is the fact that we've been able to offer our free recycling service. And if you haven't checked that out, that's one thing I think that people will will tell you, you have to check out tree huggers. They'll recycle your styrofoam. Or did you know that you don't have to throw away that chip bag? Because you can just bring it to tree huggers, and they'll do something with that. So um, by all means, the, the recycling center is something that you know, we're, we're the most proud of. And it's really the store that kind of funds the efforts of, of the bigger picture. So thank you for your time. I've been with the company over, well, close to 20 years now. And I've been, you know, kind of traveled my way through the company with now I can say about half of my career was spent in the purchasing field and the other half is spent on the other side in sales and marketing and um, I was heading up the uh, marketing and sales team for several years and you know we saw green cleaning products come and go in our industry. Um, we employ about three million people in the United States if you think about all the buildings that are cleaned, commercial buildings every day. So we can have a tremendous effect on a lot of people who use these products. But we saw them come and go about 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, there was a perception out there that they don't work very well, which was true at the time. So about 10 years ago, we saw, you know, the product start to emerge again. And um, so I seriously started paying attention to that, and, and, you know, with from our company perspective and brought the idea to uh, my boss at the time who was our CEO and said you know we really got to start paying attention to this again because we really can you know have a positive effect on the people that use these products all the time as well as the people that live in all the buildings that we clean and you know we're a mid-sized business um, we've got five locations in Michigan we, you know, touch about 4,000 different businesses and organizations on an annual basis. So if we start educating and, you know, sharing the stories with all the people that we touch every day that, you know, the effect just in our own region would be tremendous. 
So we got serious about 10 years ago and started doing the research and figuring everything out. We actually hired a consultant who is a mentor to me still today in our industry who had been, you know, pushing, you know, these products 20 years ago and just stuck with it over and over again. And um, so we hired him as a consultant to help us really formalize um, our programs and get our team educated because it was you know me alone we've got 20 salespeople out on the street every day uh, it was going to be tough to do that so um, so he helped us through a lot of that and today we you know we we've worked on many of the lead certified buildings in the area and you know m I saw it as a chance also to raise the respect level of a custodian because typically we only hear, or they only hear from management if something doesn't go right. So we saw it as a, a chance to you know, raise that respect for that role in an organization, which I believe we have done. We've seen it where they've become part of a green team, um, but you know, they have a tremendous effect on what they do every day in our buildings. Um, so, so that's kind of my story on how, how we got where we are, where we're, where we're at. We did do lead certification on our building also, and I'll talk about that a little later. Um, amazing opportunities for innovation and for uh, financial gain. The marketplace for um, sustainably sourced products, we're seeing a tremendous growth in what's called the lifestyles of health and sustainability market. Uh, that is growing in leaps and bounds as people begin to really act on their values. And um, I think as consumers, we're seeing tremendous um, level of knowledge made possible through new communication technologies. So uh, that is really reshaping the kind of transparency and responsibility that a business um, has to act upon to be successful in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. A lot of rethinking going on and really uh, circling around experiences and community as part of a product or service offering. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a real change in business. And, and it's, to me, it's sort of a hopeful change because we're moving away from just mass consumerism to discerning uh, individuals who are um, making their values known by, by their purchases. Um, first of all, it's, it's a lot easier if you have commitment at the top. Um, you know, like our company, our CEO is very committed to it. Um, I'm part of the executive management team. We've got six people on that team. Not everyone's on board with it. So it's a constant challenge for me to keep that, you know, everything in front of them um, as far as, you know, all of our sustainability efforts. So, so it makes it a whole lot easier when you do have um, commitment from the top. So my eco-business is really um, working with students. And um, the challenge, I think, is to engage them in new ways of thinking. So much of what we learn is just from being in the world that surrounds us. Um, and so how do we help people um, see in new ways, I guess, students? And that's always the challenge. The, the thrill is when they do see in new ways. And um, I have been so proud of our graduates going on to do just great things. One of them's in the room, maybe a couple more are here. Um, that is absolutely thrilling because I know that it will be a lifetime of difference that they'll be making. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me is, is to try not to be frustrated when I met with something that can't be fixed right away. Um, you know, being, you know, in the recycling industry, you know, even though we're not a recycler, we collect a lot of recycling. And, you know, I hate when somebody brings in a soy milk container that I know that there's absolutely nothing that I can do with as much as I would love to be able to. Um, or this morning I was listening to NPR and the talk of 
how 200 orangutans are likely to become extinct because of the depletion of rainforests to build palm plantations. That then in turn gets turned into sodium lauryl sulfate that becomes a surfactant in your toothpaste. You know, there's, there's not a whole lot that you can do about that right away. It's things that are going to take time and effort and energy to do. And um, that's probably the biggest challenge I face. But I guess the thrill is knowing that all the little changes that we're making are making a big difference. So, you know, that one tube of, tube of toothpaste that you're not buying that contains sodium lauryl sulfate hopefully will make a difference in the future. Um, and obviously my biggest thrill is just helping people. Um, you know, I get so excited when a family comes in and, and tells me that they haven't thrown away a bag of garbage in two weeks because of the service that we provide. Or, you know, a local restaurant here called Barter Town, you know, they can go almost three weeks without throwing away an entire bag of trash because of what we're helping them do. Um, that's the reason why I do what I do is, is to help you all do what you do, so. To be taken seriously. Um, you know, I'm, there's two women on our executive management team, the other one's in HR, and um, I mentioned earlier coming from a pretty male dominant industry, I think sometimes I'm sure I'm laughed at at some of the <laughs> ideas that I bring to the table. Um, so I think that's a challenge, but that's, you know, happens more than just the uh, sustainability role. Um, the other one is the frustrating thing that I hear a lot, um, especially in our industry, but many others too, is that, you know, the mentality of we always, we've always done it that way, um, and not thinking about new ways of doing things, because there are many ways to do things, and it gets very frustrating to me about, you know, not wanting to even consider something different. I think as women we definitely devalue ourselves and I think we, we come into a situation thinking you know that we're not worth what we should be worth um, and so I think it's it's taking that mentality out of the picture and realizing that your time effort and your your talent and your thoughts they are absolutely worth something and so I think it's building that confidence with inside of yourself you know to, to make those kind of hard conversations happen but you know, I'm saying that from a standpoint that I don't do anything that I do for money. And I'm a firm believer, and I say this every chance that I get, is that I do what I do because I'm passionate. And I'm a firm believer that I think if you do something that you're passionate about, money will always work itself out. And at least for me, it has. You know, at the end of the day, it's just what, what do you want to be known for? And I don't want my lifetime earnings put on my tombstone. So, you know, what 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 is my legacy and um i don't think of, i didn't think about that when i was 25 but <laughs> now as i'm moving towards that end um but that still doesn't make it okay that that we can't that we can do the same work that a, a man can do and, and get paid 70 percent less and and i think that's where um the ability for women to be engaged in um elected positions where we can begin to change some of the, the structures that allow those kinds of things to continue. You find uh, women entrepreneurs in all of those organizations right now and, and really making valued and valuable contributions. Um, I get asked all the time, you know, why has West Michigan been such a leader in the green building movement? And one of the responses that we, you know, have observed and that we use as a response is because of our religious roots. So, you know, and what, no matter what political party, I think we all have and have been touched by that religious um, background. Um, I would focus on green buildings or greening our existing buildings. We have um, way more existing buildings than we do new buildings. And we can do the right thing when we build a new building, but what do we do about all these existing? So I think um, 
and we've got, you know, under the U.S. Green Building Council, we have lead for existing buildings, but it's not been very well accepted in this area. It, it's bypassing us in the rest of the country, but not here for some reason. Um, and, you know, we think we understand why, um, but I think making people understand how much that affects health, um, I think that's what I would, that's what I would focus on. Um, I guess for me personally, my focus is on education and empowerment. I think that that's really important, and it's 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 literally the whole reason why I'm I'm doing what I'm doing. Is I feel like the more people that can get involved in the educational aspect, and I think everybody can agree that that green is a very trendy subject right now, and there's a lot of companies going green for the wrong reasons. And as a typical consumer, it's really easy to get confused and to know the difference between a company doing it for the right reasons versus a company doing it for the profitable reasons. Um, so the whole reason why we exist is, is really to educate people, to educate themselves, to empower themselves, and to make better choices you know, for the environment, for their families, for their safety, for all of those things, because they're all so interconnected. Um, Obviously, a huge passion of mine would have to be recycling. It's where I focused a lot of my efforts. Um, and I would say if there's one thing I could change, it would be to hold companies responsible for the packagings and, and the products that they produce. I think if we could make that one change, similar to like what Germany is doing, we'd have a lot less waste, a lot less need to recycle or reuse or recompost or what have you. Um, so if I could do one thing and one thing only, it would be that. Um, but my latest. Uh interest is really um, trying to deepen my understanding of systems and helping others to understand how systems work and more importantly how to leverage systems for change um, because I think that so much of our environmental challenges are that we don't understand the systems we don't understand how social systems match up with ecological systems um, we don't understand how systems are are nested within other systems and what those what that means um, for for change. So that's that's my real issue. At at the end of the day, we don't know what's coming. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, make the contributions where you feel passion and you feel um, progress. Um, I think that's that's my bottom line. Uh, I think for me personally, it's just to, to take one small bite of something that you've always wanted to do. And uh, it's, it's not a bunch of big changes that make a difference, it's a bunch of small ones. And so I think we get into this where we, we're like, all right, we're going to go green this week, and we're going to start composting, and we're going to start recycling, and we're going to you know, turn off all of our lights, and, and it, you're taking on too much all at one time. And so take it in little stages. You know, One month you focus on something, and once you've tackled that, you focus on the next thing. And, and the next thing you know, you've, you've tackled pretty much everything on your list. So it's to not give up. <laughs> um, my message would be to, um, gosh, I just. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about focus. <laughs> oh, my goodness, it just left me. <laughs> Take home message, what's, what's um, the action item? Oh, I know. I know what it is. To take time to reflect on the things that you have accomplished because we get so caught up in, you know, our busyness and our day-to-day -day activities that many times, you know, people will get frustrated if they're in, out doing a lot of different things. So take time to reflect on that and, you know, celebrate that because you have probably have all accomplished a lot, but have you taken time to think about it? So. Right.